Hello, my name is Dr. Susan O'Connor and I'm the Director of the Scottish Civic Trust. Thank you so much for joining me today for my lecture as part of our series of six lectures for COP26 on the intersection themes of heritage, equity and the climate crisis. I'm just going to share my screen with you now. So my theme for today is restoring our future, how investing in built heritage can make for fairer, greener places. Uh, and before we get started, I want to give credit for the inspiration for this talk. And um, my thinking has been very largely informed by Professor Karen Bell's book, Working Class Environmentalism, An Agenda for a Just and Fair Transition to Sustainability, uh, in relation to the larger issues of the climate crisis and environmental equity. Professor Bell's book is supplemented by my own knowledge and lived experience as director of the Scottish Civic Trust in relation to heritage and how it is impacted by climate issues with supporting data drawn from his Glasgow City Council, Historic Environment Scotland and other sources as well. And I want to be clear that although my talk will give quite a lot of focus to issues in Glasgow, it's not intended to be specifically critical of Glasgow City Council, rather I'm using them as my example because it's relevant to COP26 and Glasgow is the city that I know best. The themes I'll be discussing are by no means unique to Glasgow and um, it's more the implementation of them here that I'm most familiar with. So before we get started, I'm just going to give you some definitions that will help your understanding of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'll be talking quite a lot about the working class and by working class in this context, what I mean is people without a financial safety net or a power holding network whose earnings place them in the bottom 10% of income level. I'll also be referring to middle class people. And by that, I mean people who have a financial or cultural power holding support network uh, whose impact, income may vary. And um, there's a very big difference between middle class environmentalism, which tends to focus uh, on crisis as a, on a global scale and looking at some species loss, deforestation, rise of sea levels, loss of the polar ice caps and working class environmentalism, which really takes uh, an anthropocentric approach um, and looks at how environmental change impacts on health, access to work and opportunities to play. This is referred to as the environmental justice movement, or you'll hear about environmental injustice if you're in the US or environmental inequality in the UK. Uh, I tend to use environmental justice myself, so you'll hear me refer to that throughout the rest of this talk. It's that anthropocentric approach with, based around the interests of humans, uh, which gives us the drive for understanding why the working class view of the climate crisis is so cl closely aligned to cultural heritage, because of course that's to do with the things that humans make. So for today's talk, I'm going to be talking through the overlapping themes of environment, heritage and equity. And I'm going to suggest to you that the working class experience of heritage has almost always got a strong element of environmental inequity attached to it. And by making improvements in how we treat our built heritage in particular, we can simultaneously address inequity and the climate crisis. I'm going to work through a variety of examples, all of which relate to Scotland, and most of which examine Glasgow in particular. Much of my evidence is map based, based and has been drawn from the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation, or the SIMD as we call it, which locates deprivation geographically in Scotland. And there's a link to the SIMD website given at the end of this talk. So the structure of today's talk is based around the different ways in which the working class of experience of heritage and the environment is disadvantaged. And I split it into three different categories, everyday life, access, decision making. And I would say that there are quite a few more than those, but time is quite limited today. So hopefully using just these examples, I'll be able to build a compelling case that will persuade you of the importance of heritage in the environmental justice debate. So first of all, we're going to talk about everyday life. And this section is going to focus primarily on working classes experience of everyday heritage, which in Scotland and in Glasgow particularly is largely centred around tenement living. Glasgow is home to an estimated 70,000 um, pre-1919 flatted properties, which are referred to as tenements in the Scottish context. They make up approximately 21% of all properties in the city to give you a sense, a sense of the context. Tenements are very important uh, as part of Scotland's built heritage and Glasgow and Edinburgh in particular have their own types that define the nature of city living. They're so important that the tenements in Glasgow's Highland area are a conservation area in their own right, designated specifically to protect the building type. 
So the map on the left, which was very kindly prepared for me by Glasgow City Council, shows the location of all 1919 properties across the entire council area. And you can see from the map on the right, I have abstracted all the tenements from that map to create the map so you can get a sense of their geographic spread. Tenant properties are not just a preserve of the working class in Glasgow. There are areas in the south and west of the city where tenements are very much middle class and upper middle class. And if we cross reference our tenement map, which you can see there, with uh, the SIMD map of Glasgow, where red indicates the most deprived areas, you can see where the working class people are most likely to be living in pre-1919 tenements. So the areas in purple there are the intersection between the lowest decile residents in terms of um, economics and the pre-1919 tenements in Glasgow are indicated by blue, giving us a purple overlay, which shows where those people are most likely to be living. As you might anticipate, although already a high density living solution, some tenements are more high density than others. And there's a huge variation from the three story, four bedroom tenements in Mount Florida to the four, five story, one bedroom flats that you might find in Denniston. These tenements are kind of a density that you'd really struggle to get through a modern um, planned apartment. High density living in heritage buildings such as these when serviced properly is an excellent response to the climate crisis because people living in close proximity require fewer resources to service their needs in terms of water and energy supply. They use fewer cars because shops and leisure facilities are located nearby capturing the local market and in theory anyway more open space is left to nature. In considering the ways to combat the climate crisis as a local government entity, it would make sense to concentrate your efforts where you're most likely to get the biggest impact for your public spending, right? So spend the money where most people are likely to reap the greatest rewards. Well, as the examples I'm going to talk through now demonstrate, that doesn't seem to be the case here in Glasgow. Let's start off talking about cycling. It's uh, commonly promoted as an important tool to beat the climate crisis cycling as a form of commuting and as a means of transport more generally is seen as a great alternative to cars with additional health and well-being benefits. But if you live in a tenement, it's common for there to be no place for you to safely keep your bicycle. And this makes people living in tenements less likely to cycle, and therefore more reliant on private cars or public transport to travel. This in turn has a knock-on impact of crowding out the streets around tenements with cars and indeed buses, whose fumes um, are particularly noxious to the soft buff and red sandstone, which the majority of Glasgow's tenements are built with. The acid released by petrol and diesel fumes breaks down the surface of the stone and it makes it much more susceptible to decay mechanisms. And if you'd like to find out a bit more about that, there's excellent information from the Stark Environment Scotland side website, or there's a very good book which I've referenced at the end of this talk. It seems like a no-brainer then on both environment and heritage grounds to make it simpler for people living in historic tenements to own and cycle and to store bicycles safely. And to their credit, this is exactly what Glasgow City Council did by installing these rather nice looking cycling huts around the city in 60 different locations. And you can see those locations marked on the map there on the left hand side. Local residents can apply for a key to lock their bikes there, safe in the knowledge that it will be secure, very close to their front door. Except they didn't install them equally in all areas with tenements. They were very selective. So we've got, as I say, the map on the left, which shows you the location, which I have overlaid with our tenement SIMD map. And you can see the, map, the marks in green are the locations of the cycle huts. And they really manage very, very well to escape all of the areas of crossover where we know that working class people living in historic tenements live. Um, in numbers, although the SAIMD 10th most deprived percentile makes up 29% of Glaswegians, only 16% can access a cycling hut. In other words, working class people living in heritage buildings are at the greatest density, who potentially have the most to gain from free transport and cleaner air, are not being given the same opportunities as middle class people. So, Everyday waste disposal. It's true as in the historic building sector to say that the best way to preserve the built heritage is to occupy it. Empty buildings decay faster than occupied ones, but they are far cheaper to repair than replace. And of course, they have the added benefit of reusing embodied energy again and again. For people to want to live in historic buildings, they have to be attractive as far as possible from an environmental perspective. Now, Glasgow's tenements, in my very biased opinion, and let's just skip back up to have a little look at them. There we are. I've got that aesthetic quality down in spades. They look great from the outside. 
They're spacious, they have large windows, but there are major downsides to them as well. They have narrow little bathrooms, often dark shared closes and no lifts going up what can be many, many flights of stairs. And then there is waste disposal. Accommodation for waste disposal in historic Glasgow tenements is anything but consistent. Some flats have designed bin areas to the rear of their garden areas from which disposal trucks can access waste. Some use the ground floor area of tenements themselves for storing the bins, and some tenements keep their bins to the front of their property. It is at best haphazard and ad hoc. But given the priority put on personal waste segregation, how much we're all told that the future of the planet relies on us separating out our plastics, surely this has been the first area for action by local authorities with a high proportion of tenements. Let's not forget that 73% of Glasgow's population lives in tenements old and new. If we want to foreground good waste segregation, this is the best place to invest, isn't it? Well, not so much. In Glasgow City Council areas, currently there is no comprehensive system of garden waste disposal for tenement dwellers, for example. Tenements can apply for a trial scheme, and even then they have to safely present the bin to the curbside unlike other waste, which is usually collected for them from a communal area without organised intervention from the residents. Tenement dwellers also don't have access to glass recycling at their own property and have to find neighbourhood recycling skips to bring their waste glass to. There have been a number of recent stories in the press about these disappearing, reducing the opportunities for recycling. By contrast, if you can afford to live in a private house in Glasgow, you can have your own glass recycling bin and a garden waste bin. And needless to say, new flatted properties are all built with segregated waste storage designed in. And it's not as if Glasgow City Council are not aware of this impartial provision. Their leaflet on curbside recycling for house dwellers is available in just English, and you can see it there on the left of your screen, while the leaflets on tenement recycling is available in Romanian, Slovakian and Urdu, the languages of New Scots who are more likely to be working in lower paid jobs. I'm not even going to comment on the wisdom of using the same stock image in each leaflet for trying to encourage recycling between very different ethnic groups. The lack of priority put on the day-to-day -day workings of waste disposal for tenement properties is echoed in capital investment. 931 historic tenemented streets in Glasgow were designed with private back lanes behind them, mainly to allow for fuel deliveries and the discrete disposal of waste. And you can see an image of a very typical one there on the left side of your screen. Unfortunately, the ownership of these lanes was often tied to individual tenement buildings themselves, meaning that there's no local government responsibility for maintenance. The lanes are also often very narrow with uneven surfaces, which, do, which does make access quite difficult. And as a result, in many areas, waste disposal contractors refuse to remove rubbish from them, creating fly tipping zones that are deeply unpleasant and can turn into a public health hazard, as well as creating a safety issue for local residents. A Glasgow City Council report from, 20, from 2002 estimated it would cost roughly 50 million to refurbish all of Glasgow's lanes. And just for inflation, that looks more like 83 million pounds today. However, there's no comprehensive, comprehensive action plan to deal with this issue. A toolkit has been prepared to help concerned civic groups, which features council funded projects in historic tenements in Battlefield and Woodlands, areas corresponding neatly with, and you have probably guessed by now, areas of middle class tenement dwelling as defined by the S. And you can see where those spots are there. Those are the yellow dots in screen where the trial projects were run, neatly placed right in the middle of middle class dwellers of pre-1990 tenants. Glasgow City Council is due to announce a new lane improvement fund in the next couple of weeks, which will be aimed at constituted groups. In other words, well-established neighbourhoods with a low transient population where people are invested enough to form a special interest group. Because of this, I'm comfortable predicting that the vast majority of this improvement fund will be spent in middle class areas. And of course, on one level, it makes sense to target the easy win areas where you can be confident of a result. But it does make more pro more mean that the more, more difficult problems are allowed to foster and worsen. Good waste disposal provision is a central tenant of our personal response to the climate crisis and impacts hugely on people's feelings of well-being. There is little more likely to turn you off living in a particular area than the overwhelming smell of waste or the sight of flight tipping out of your back window. It indicates a lack of care and oversight that impacts on your sense of personal safety. And importantly, it sets the local culture for maintenance. 
Why would you want to live in a tenement if you're going to be smelling your neighbor's weak old vegetable peelings all the time? Why would you take care to look after your building if there's been a mattress sat in your back lane for three months? By not creating the conditions for good waste disposal in tenements, Glasgow is both ignoring the opportunity to help the less well-off positively impact on the climate crisis, and it is making it less likely that those people will be willing to live in historic tenemented properties, raising the long-term prospect of vacancy and potential dereliction, and making their engagement with the built heritage less likely. Moving on now to talk about access. There is a reason why as school children were all bussed off to historic sites, and it's to foster an interest in the built heritage from a young age. Simply put, the physical experience of heritage is very meaningful in developing a long-standing sense of connection, engagement, and responsibility. It's why museums have handling kits. They understand the importance of getting your hands on something for developing a sense of ownership. And it's why we run doors open days here at the Scottish Civic Trust, to give as many people as possible free access to heritage. But try as we might, access to heritage is very much a class issue. This is because investment in public transport as part of strategies addressing the climate crisis tends to prioritise increasing and supporting rail provision over bus transport. This is despite the substantially higher capital investment costs of rail over bus, particularly in Scotland, where the uneven terrain of the highlands and islands presents very unique challenges. The Scottish Government published their Rail and Electric uh, Rail Services Decarbonisation Action Plan last July, which promotes a highly ambitious expansion, repair and electrification plan for a rail up to 2035, with no price tag attached. And for buses, a £500 million bus partnership fund. It's nowhere near the same magnitude of investment or interest. Why rail? Is it because middle class people use trains more than working class people who catch nearly four times as many buses as trains, according to UK Department of Transport? Whatever it is, poor public transport provision not only encourages polluting car use, it also has a direct impact on how accessible remote heritage is for the working classes. Here's a very useful example. The international hit show Outlander sets much of its first series on the Isle of Skye to the west, uh, to the northwest actually of Scotland. It's an idyllic location and one that has seen an astronomical increase in tourism since the show came out. Outlander is big both internationally and with local audiences here in Scotland, so it's not surprising that more people want to visit the island's nat rich natural and built heritage. If you have access to a car, you can get there from our offices in Glasgow in just under five hours, as we can see on this Google map to the left. However, if you don't have access to a car and just ask Google to figure out a public transport route, as you can see from the right hand side, it's unable to find you any option at all. You can go all the way north uh, to Inverness, as you can see on the screen on the left, and then take a bus west. But the best possible option will take you well over eight hours, allowing for a minimal waiting time and will cost you £74 each way, or as I like to call it, more than an entire day's work on the minimum wage of £8.91 per hour here in Scotland. And that's from our very centrally located offices in Glasgow, where we are five minutes walk from the main bus and rail terminals. What if you're in a large housing estate in the outskirts of Glasgow, as many of the working class are? You could easily add another hour onto the travelling time, taking it to about nine hours. So here are the facts. It will take a family of four travelling from central Glasgow five hours and about £112 to drive to Skye. It will take the same family on public transport about eight hours and £300 to get there. If those adults are on minimum wage, that's a week's take-home pay for one of them. And that's not even including the cost of the take-home journey. At the return journey. You need to be a deeply committed uh, heritage fan to be willing to spend that money and time to get to Scotland. Even for an Outlander super fan on minimum wage, that is a very big commitment. So you can see that for people without a car, visiting uh, remote heritage sites is prohibitive. It's very straightforward to visit sites on the central belt and in the cities of Glasgow, where public transport is very good, but out with the main tourist attractions, it is extremely difficult without a car. The codicil to this is that much of Scotland's heritage is geographically diverse. There are very large numbers of castles, country houses and kirks spread far across the mainland and its islands, many of which are uniquely fascinating because of the impact of that remoteness on their design. The image I'm going to show you here 
is a map illustrating the density of listed buildings across Scotland, as it provides a good demonstration of the spread of Scotland's historic buildings. Scotland's heritage is not solely defined by what is found in urban settings, and an understanding of our heritage in those terms is both skewed and, to be honest, it's pretty bland. Non-car owning pe working class people are effectively banned, barred from accessing remote heritage because of poor public transport infrastructure and funding. As we've seen, driving a car is by far the quickest and cheapest way to visit remote heritage sites, increasing air pollution and causing traffic jams on the remote one track roads at their destination. By not funding better public transport to remote locations, we're both damaging the environment and promoting a system of selective engagement with heritage. This disenfranchises the voices of poor people as participants with an appropriate depth of knowledge to be considered as legitimate decision makers. And finally, let's have a chat about decision making. As Karen Bell notes in her book, the right to inclusion in environmental decision making is enshrined in both the Rio and the Aarhus conventions. However, on environmental issues, there is a tendency towards middle class land grab where consultation events are designed to suit the skills, timescales and locations of the middle class and thus become dominated by those voices, in turn marginalising the voices of the working class. Consultation events are held at times to suit those working traditional nine to five jobs or done online through complex forms that can be challenging for those with lower levels of literacy. In-person events tend to be run as formal meetings, which again can promote engagement issues for those who have not been in a formal setting since school. And most importantly, from our perspective, the location of consultation events tends to be in places that suit those doing the consulting rather than the consultees, such as council premises or in sports complexes. These locations may be geographically remote from the actual site of environmental impact and indeed from people who are supposed to be being consulted. The issue of location is paramount because physical consultations are very important for working class people who may not have the skills or experience to interpret information in two dimensions or have access to the level of connection needed to download data rich documents timelessly or in full. So it's important to have these conversations as locally as possible, because as we've seen, travel time and cost can be a real barrier to access and engagement. And yet up and down the country, public halls and other community spaces are being closed by cash strapped councils who say they are too expensive to maintain. These spaces are very often architectural gems, as you can see from the few examples I've popped on the screen there in front of you. These are built by benefactors in remote locations in the 19th and early 20th centuries in particular. And this map from Historic Environment Scotland of some 692 listed public halls in Scotland, which goes, goes some way to de demonstrating their geographic spread. There is one for roughly every 6,000 people in Scotland, making them a particularly good option for facilitating local democracy. Each time one of these spaces is closed, the opportunity for real inclusion in decision making decreases. Each time one of these spaces closes, a part of local identity is lost. Each time one of these spaces closes, people have to travel farther to be part of the discussion. And if people can't meet easily, they cannot participate, debate or organise. Closing public halls is bad for heritage, bad for working class people and bad for the environment. Of course, some local groups have taken the threat of closure of their local public hall as a challenge and have rallied together to exercise their community asset transfer rights to take ownership and gather funds for refurbishment, resulting in some really wonderful success stories. We at the Scottish Civic Trust mentor quite a few of these groups through our My Place mentoring scheme. But the makeup of these groups I've discussed this with other colleagues of similar experience to my own in Scotland, and we have yet to come across even one that is majority working class or has working class leadership. Middle class people dominate because they have the ability to fill in the forms, attend the meetings, and most importantly of all, from my own experience, speak in the linguistic register of the funders. And if middle class groups are dominating refurbishment product projects, they will go on to play a key role in colouring what the actual community ownership of a building is. In other words, how and who feels they can use the public hall. So the end of result might not be a true community facility at all. Through all of these issues that I've discussed, everyday life, access and decision making, I hope I proved that the innate connections between equity and environment and heritage exists. It's clear that they cannot be solved, as some in the active field might suggest, 
by the actions of individuals. State level intervention to drive through equitable changes to transport, waste disposal and decision making is the only way to tackle the problems I've highlighted. But how to make that palatable? Well, who doesn't love castles? Since the early 19th century, Scotland has been riding a heady wave of romanticism based on that vision of Sir Walter Scott in Ivanhoe. As we all know from the success of Outlander, that thirst for castles and glens has yet to be sated two centuries later. Facetiousness aside, heritage is a no-brainer in terms of positivity. It is very, very difficult to argue that Glasgow's tenements aren't crucial to the city's identity and therefore should be made as attractive as possible to live in. Who could deny that democratising access to remote heritage sites would be a good thing? And surely we would all agree that, that Scotland's attractiveness is in large part down to the uniqueness of the buildings in its tiny villages and towns. Why not fund those things? So I say this, why not let heritage be the Trojan horse of environmental change? Throughout history, our buildings, culture and stories have been interpreted to legitimise past and future actions with great success. In 2021, why don't we start to use them to achieve environmental justice? Thank you very much for watching. Uh, you'll see some references here on screen from my talk. And if you'd like to continue the conversation, please do get in touch with me through the means listed uh, under the Scottish Civic Trust section bit just there. If you haven't already, I would really highly recommend you watch the other talks in the series. And I hope they'll stimulate your thinking on the intersection between climate, equity, and indeed heritage. Thanks again. <laughs>